peace. Brother Naheem, a.k.a. Lord Abba, a.k.a. Mr. Just the Facts. Um, I want to give a shout out to everybody that's listening. I see a couple of the mods in the building. I want to give a shout out to, to my BTP bros. Got my brother Logic, got my brother Josh in the building. My brother Ali will be on soon. Um, I want to I want to give a shout out to my 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 street dudes as well, man. I, I get a lot of messages from a lot of, of of my brothers in the streets and a couple of the sisters as well. You know, they they love the way we take this platform and simplify the message in a way that they can understand it. So I'll be getting a lot of messages. So I want to give a shout out to my my hood dudes that's starting to wake up and get into politics. Uh, as you come in, family, particularly if you're on YouTube, hit the like button, hit the share button. This is going to be a powerful, powerful discussion tonight. Uh, we're going to get into the unconstitutionality of slavery. You know, there's a book out by a man named Lysander Spooner. He, he wrote two volumes called The Unconstitutionality of Slavery in the late 1800s. I should have that year off the top of the head. I actually have the book pulled up, but I have it on the page that I want to cite from. But what I want to do is I want to I want to start by reading from a little bit from from Frederick Douglass. You know, I, we, we got to frame this unconstitutionality part. And, and Frederick Douglass was a, a clear champion for our people. And when he woke up to the fact that what William Lloyd Garrison, the man who was his mentor, an abolitionist, was saying wasn't right and exact, well, Frederick Douglass took a different approach. In fact, in 1843, uh, William Lloyd Garrison said of the Constitution that it was a covenant with death and, a, and an agreement with hell. And, and this has been cited. Up until recently, I've, I've seen this phrase used in, in a lot of, uh, maybe you want to call them Afrocentric or RBG type of circles. But it wasn't until Spooner's publication of The Unconstitutionality of Slavery, Volumes 1 and Volume 2, that Garrison changed his view. And he, he said, we admit Mr. Spooner's reasoning to be ingenious, perhaps as an effort in logic, unanswerable. This is how powerful the book that uh, Spooner wrote. It was just, it was powerful. And if anybody read it, it's a book that I've been citing for years. My brothers and I have been building on this particular works for years. But what I want to do is I, before I open it up, I want to start with some of the words of Frederick Douglass because he, he gives us a rather important understanding of the unconstitutionality of slavery. So let me let me share my screen with you all. And I want to read a little bit of this because this is this is important. And I'm not this is a, a long letter, so I'm not going to get into this whole whole thing. But he says this. Frederick Douglass says. The thing must not be left to interference, but must be done in plain English. I know how this view of this subject is treated by the class represented at the city hall. They are in the habit of treating the Negro as an exception to general rules. When their own liberty is in question, they will avail themselves of all rules of law which protect and defend their freedom. Sound familiar? But when the black man's rights are in question, they concede everything, admit everything from slavery, and put liberty to the proof. They reserve the common law usage and presume the Negro a slave unless he can prove himself free. Sort of like they do today. They presume us criminals unless we could uh, prove otherwise. It continues, I, on the other hand, presume him free unless he is proved to be otherwise. Let us look at the objects for which the Constitution was framed and adopted and see if slavery is one of them. 
Here are its own objects as set forth by itself. Quote, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America, end quote. The objects here set forth are six in number. Union, defense, welfare, tranquility, justice, and liberty. These are all good objects. And slavery, so far from being among them, is a foe of them all. But it has been said that Negroes are not included within the benefits sought under this declaration. This is said by slaveholders in America. It is said by the city hall orator, but it is not said by the constitution itself. Its language is quote unquote, we the people, not we the white people, not even we the citizens, not we the privileged class, not we the high, not we the low, but we the people, not we the horses, sheep and swine and wheelbarrows, but we the people, we the human inhabitants. And if Negroes are people, they are included in the benefits for which the Constitution of America was ordained and established. But how dare any man who pretends to be a friend to the Negro thus gratuitously concede away what the Negro has a right to claim under, under the Constitution? Why should such friends invent new arguments to increase the hopelessness of his bondage. This I undertake to say as the conclusion of the whole matter that the constitutionality of slavery can be made out only by disregarding the plain and common sense reading of the constitution itself. By discrediting and casting away its worthless, the most beneficent rules of legal interpretation by ruling the Negro outside of these beneficent rules by claiming that the Constitution does not mean what it says and that it says what it does not mean, by disregarding the written Constitution and interpreting it in the light of a secret understanding. It is in this mean, contemptible, and underhanded method that the American Constitution is pressed into the service of slavery. And I'm going to end it right there. And let me bring my, bro, my bros back in. And, you know, I, I wanted to start off with Frederick Douglass, one of our great freedom fighters, great abolitionists. This is from a letter from 1860. Frederick Douglass, the Constitution of the United States. Is it pro-slavery or anti-slavery? I'm going to put this in the description as well, and I'm going to put it in the chat. So any of uh, other bros want to jump in real quick? And, and, you know, chime in on, on what you heard and, or just get into your demonstrations on this powerful topic tonight. Man, yes, that was absolutely powerful. So I, I encourage everyone who just heard that to, like, he's going to put in, go get that, read that again, read it a few times, get that understanding of what that, because that was really, really, really powerful. And what we're, what we're talking about, and what I what I get from that conversation that we just listened to is that there's nothing right. We have been tricked to into believing a false narrative of history and, and we, we've unraveled a lot of them. But I think this is kind of like the biggest one, that the fact that the institution of slavery was unconstitutional. I think when we start to really look at this, we start seeing that we can actually analyze this thing from a, a, a whole new space. So with, with what we just read, nothing in the founding documents, nothing in the tools that they used to build this new republic created an institution that I acknowledged holding property in men. And that the, the very fact that the relationship prior to transitioning into a new republic, this understanding was there and it existed. And now that we know, if we look at the 
see, we're we're in a different space today. So if we if we look at the the founding documents, what are they? If we look at the Declaration of Independence. What is it talking about? Right? There's talk. There all of these things are talking about the same thing. If we go into the preamble, what are they talking about in the preamble? If you look at the Bill of Rights, right? What is being expressed there? They're talking about a concept of all, liberty and justice for all. Nowhere in these tools that they used to build did they say there's going to be a specific group. We know who they are because they didn't just appear out of thin air. We've been working with them as uh, our former politi uh, body politic, England, right? So did, they could have purposely said there's going to be a specific group of individuals who are not going to be recognized in uh, this framework. But they kind of covered that when they said all. They said all men, right? everybody liberty and justice for all so what we're seeing in and what we're going to explain is how this hypocrisy of chattel slavery was absolutely unconstitutional and we can actually uh elevate this conversation in today's time to make some real impactful changes and uh some some transformation that can clear up things for that you won't even believe so uh I'm gonna bring some stuff back. I know uh, I'm gonna pass it. I just wanted to, that just that concept is just so powerful to me, and so I want to pass it back. And um, that's what I got for that. I got some later. Yeah, I wanted to say something, man. man y'all, y'all brought some brought forth some powerful um, perspective, especially especially uh, the, the opening piece. Uh, but I wanted to say it's important that for maybe people that don't understand. The importance of like showing how slavery was unconstitutional because in the prior episode you guys may have watched uh we talked about how um we were day one citizens right and so when you look at the stand from look at this thing from the standpoint of us being day one citizens then we see that america enslaved its own citizens so now with this piece we're showing how not only did America enslave its own citizens, but obviously that would be, and, and it's more, and we're going to make the case for how slavery itself was unconstitutional. So we did, so they did, there was an unconstitutional act against its own citizens who America enslaved. So do you understand how this beefs up the case for reparations? Because I'm going to, I'm going to leave it with this. How can you say because understand this, and I've seen I've seen some articles out there. I, I may get into one tonight, uh, where people are trying to make a case how reparations would be unconstitutional. But see, <laughs> what would make the rate to say reparations is unconstitutional when slavery is unconstitutional? You see how much more powerful you so we gotta pull out all the knives and all the stuff that people ain't necessarily thought about addressing. To, to make preemptive moves against the racists and the devils who are trying to invalidate our reparations claim. But I want to leave it with you, Ali. Yeah, so I would just reiterate, man, um, that all of this is being done, and in, 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 for everyone to keep in mind, that all of this is being done in order to bolster the reparations case, right? We're not just saying, we're not just bringing up a bunch of history just for the sake of bringing up history. This is indeed being done for the sake of bolstering the reparations claim, strengthening the reparations claim. So just always bear, you know, keep that in mind. Um, I, don't, I don't know where you wanted to go, uh, Naheem, at this point. I don't want to keep talking out. Maybe there's more you wanted to bring up because there's some no. things that I jumped into. No, no, I, no, actually, Actually, I, I want y'all to I want y'all to get in. I just wanted to open up with mm -hmm. with Frederick Douglass's understanding because I wanted to like we got a lot of people that listen to it's like that William Lloyd Garrison piece, right? Mm -hmm. Uh what was the exact quote? Let me pull that quote back up. He he said that the Constitution of the United States was a covenant with death and an agreement. A, an agreement with hell. This view has been held by a lot of our people who are anti-American. And we are at the point now where we could understand why they're 
they were anti-American. Oh, yeah. But what a phrase like that does is it makes them not want to be participatory in government. It makes them makes them not want to attain towards a proper civic learning, a, a proper civic understanding so that they themselves can become informed electors. It makes them wave their hands at the whole system. So I, I wanted to read that Frederick Douglass piece because it was in large part a response to what William Lloyd Garrison was promoting. Now, remember, William Lloyd Garrison was an abolitionist, but he was also a mentor to Frederick Douglass. So I, I want y'all to come in. I'll just bring up some of the points as, as we go along. I just wanted to, to set the stage with that because people need to understand how important an understanding of the Constitution is and the fact that Three fifths, the three fifths clause is not does not mean human, our people, Negroes, blacks, coloreds, whatever you want to call us, were three fifths of a of a human, right? That's not what it meant. And 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 other instances that we find in the document that were literally made up by people. And I'm gonna as we go along, I'm gonna pull some things up. So uh, if you wanted to get in, I don't know if you and Logic was going to go first on y'all's presentation, but y'all could y'all set it off. I I'm going to just jump in. You're muted. Your, your mic was muted. No, I'm saying, yeah, go ahead, Ali. All right. Um, go ahead and uh, do what you do. All right. So one of the things I want the family to know is that what we're talking about in terms of the unconstitutionality of slavery, that particular perspective, um, black citizenship from the founding of, uh, of the United States, these are not new concepts. These are actually very old concepts that were around for a long time. They, they're just concepts that kind of have been buried, like Brother Logic alluded to earlier. And um, we, we have to bring these things out in order to bolster the claim. And so one of the things that we're doing is coming from a book called The Unconstitutionality of Slavery. It's actually a book written by a, a, a man named Lysander Spooner. You guys should look this up. Look up the book, Lysander Spooner's uh, book, The Unconstitutionality of Slavery. And in that book, uh, he actually builds a really solid case for its unconstitutionality um, starting from the laws of England, the granting of the charters by the sovereigns of England, whether it was jo uh, uh, King Charles or King George, um, the colonial charters. Um, he goes from there to the Declaration of Independence. He goes from the Declaration of Independence to the statutes, um, the statutes, I mean, the state constitutions, um, the Articles of Confederation, uh, the statutes of the then states, you know, then the United States um, Constitution itself. So, in every stage of his argument, he's examining all of these different things from, like I said, the laws of England, the Somerset case, Somerset versus Stewart, all the way up to the United States Constitution. And he lays out a really, really solid case for the unconstitutionality of slavery based on the fact that slavery as an institution was not authorized by the statute or common laws of England, nor was it authorized by the charters that was granted to the colonists. Um, the subsequent state constitutions at the time of the adoption of the United States Constitution, um, none of those authorized chattel slavery the United States Constitution itself did not authorize it. So this is where we're coming from. We're coming from this particular perspective that's been that's been around for a long time. This is not our perspective. It's just something that we are in agreement with because it makes all the sense in the world. Like, like Brother Josh said, the United States basically enslaved or allowed to be enslaved a, a, a portion of its citizenry. So when we talk about 
the Declaration of Independence and when it says that governments are instituted for the purpose of securing the rights, the unalienable rights that were granted to every man by his creator. Governments are instituted specifically for the purpose of protecting those rights. One of them being the right to life, the, the other significant one, significant one being liberty. Liberty, right? We all know what liberty means, right? And so what the, what the government failed to do was protect the liberty of a portion of its citizenry by allowing this thing called Negro chattel slavery to exist under its sovereignty. So uh, let me read something very uh, interesting uh, that Spooner says in the unconstitutionality about the writ of habeas corpus. <laughs> very interesting. He says this, and this is in chapter three. Do you want me to share this or or do you want me to just read it? Um, I don't know. It's up to you, bro. If you wanted to share it or all right. Well, again, people, this is chapter three of the unconstitutionality of slavery by Lars Sanders Spooner. He says this: when our ancestors came to this country, they brought with them the common law of England including the writ of habeas corpus, the essential principle of which, as will hereafter be shown, is to deny the right of property in man. The trial by jury and the other great principles of liberty which prevail in England and which have made it impossible that her soil should be tried by the foot of a slave. These principles were incorporated into all the charters granted to the colonies. The general provisions of those charters, as will be seen from the extracts given in this note, were that the laws of the colony should not be repugnant or contrary, but as nearly as circumstances would allow, conformable to the laws, statutes, and rights of our kingdom of England. So the point is, those charters were the fundamental constitutions of those colonies. None of the charters authorized and we can pull them up i actually have all of the charters that were granted to the colonists um by the sovereigns of england charles and george from, from uh virginia to georgia to north carolina etc none of them mentioned the word slavery none of them mentioned the word negro none of them mentioned the words africans none of them mentioned the words white well they might mention white, I have to go and look at it, but I don't think they do. From what I've seen, I've not seen the word white in any of the charters. So again, those charters are the fundamental constitutions of those colonies. None of those things authorize the institution of chattel slavery. So I think that's important as we move forward, coming into uh, the states as they be become states after the American Revolution to show that even stemming from this, the charters and the laws of England, there was nothing there that actually authorized this institution, right? We mentioned on the last uh, episode where we were talking about um, the misunderstanding of three-fifth compromise, that it was basically a situation where they just did stuff, right? It was, we were basically subject to the whims of, 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 of Europeans at a certain point in time. They just started doing stuff because they outnumbered our people. So it, it was basically a thing done by force. It didn't really have anything to do with constitutionality and whatever laws that they enacted were actually in contradiction to uh, their charters and then their subsequent state constitutions. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Hey, hey Ali, yeah. Ali, I want to ask you something because you said something. Uh, the first thing you said was a writ of habeas corpus. I don't think people maybe if you haven't been involved with anything in prison or you don't you're not familiar with law you're not familiar with Latin or legalese you may not understand what that is could you break right. that so down basically the, the writ of habeas corpus uh was something that was put in place so that people would not be held uh and bondage without cause right so let me just read let me give you the actual definition so that people can know exactly what it 
A writ of habeas corpus is a, a writ requiring a person under arrest to be brought before a judge or into a court, especially to secure the person's release unless lawful grounds are shown for their detention. Right? And then um, let me just go a little bit further with it. Let me go a little bit further. It says it, it is a recourse in law through which a person can report an unlawful detention or imprisonment to a court and request that the court order the custodian, uh, the custodian of the person, usually a prison official, to bring the prisoner to the court to determine whether the, de the detention is lawful. Uh, the writ of habeas corpus is known as the great and efficacious writ in all manner of illegal confinement. So, um, so basically, what, what Spooner was what, what Spooner is saying is that the purpose, the purpose of the writ of habeas corpus, is to is to deny the right of property and man, meaning to hold people unlawfully, right? Because there is no law. Remember, his whole position is that there is no law that authorizes the right to property and man. These people basically are deriving their idea of the right to property and man from their Christian ideals, right? This comes from this comes from their concepts of Christianity and how they've interpreted the Bible and what those things mean in terms of the curse of Ham, how it affects Canaan, who they view, who are the Canaanites in their view, etc. So at the end of the day, that stuff comes from their Christianity, the whole idea of Negroes being cursed into this servitude stems from this curse on Ham that falls on his son Canaan. So there is no actual constitutional law. There is no, um, there is no written law, statutory law. There is no common law, case law that actually authorizes any of this. This stuff is all being derived from their ideas of their religious, uh, their religious uh, um, understanding of the Bible. Yo, know, can, can I jump in real quick? Because yes. I'm processing it all, and and if you think about it, right. This is not what we're what we're talking about. Really, isn't something that you can't really comprehend. And, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm gonna liken it to something else. So we talked about the property man habeas corpus, and he just explained it, right? So we understand. We talked in our last program and went into the Black Patriots, the Native Black Americans who fought in the war to create an America, not build it yet. We fought, killed, died, right? to even make America possible in an actual war, right? So they, the people who we just talked about brought that brought habeas corpus over here that knew we were all the people and, and we, we didn't have this concept of property and men, they did it anyway. And they were doing it anyway, right? So we have them on documents saying that they don't believe in that, but they're doing it anyway, right? So then they're doing it in a political system. And so, we can understand how this works. What I'm seeing is an institution that was just like, uh, what I'm seeing is a, a criminal operation. This is the way the uh, institution of slavery started. If you if look at it, it's a criminal operation. It started out similar to how the families of the La Costa Nostra came to America and started crime syndicates. And they used what was once illegal uh, to gain wealth, influence, and power. They they rose uh, politicians up to advocate for the policies that would make their industries and enterprises advance and be great. So then you get a, a, a bootlegging system that gets legalized and you see that the, the wealthy man like uh, John F. Kennedy uh, Jr.'s father, right, who was a bootlegger, right, was able to turn an illegitimate industry and make it legitimate with political action. Right. So that's what we have seen with these institutions created through regional government. Right. We don't see it on the when the initial agreement comes down, we don't see nothing about no property in men. And to, when do we start seeing property? So it was a hush hush thing. Everybody knew what was going on, but there was no laws creating institutions to sanction it on the books yet. So what happened? We get the regional government saying, you know what? We're going to do it. So Virginia writes the first slave law. The slave, the state legislation comes out of Virginia. 
So you, now you were getting statutory law on the state level, right? Before they started putting it in, actually into their constitutional languages. But, uh, so we see that start to happen. So, but it's a, just like a criminal enterprise starts out as illegitimate and becomes a legitimate in certain respects. This is how the institution of child slavery was moving in the, pro, in the concept of free labor, forced labor out of men and, you know, depressing them and reducing them to property. Very vicious thing, but it happened, right? So there was a betrayal on the black patriots who fought. Now we're being moved into this system, right? So moving forward, the constitutionality of it on a federal level was never met sanctioning this thing, making it part of the American government, right? So it was tolerated. The federal government is complicit in this thing because they tolerated it. And they knew what the states were doing. Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, they just start coming one after another. Now we have a domino effect of policy that is turning people into and putting people into private bondage. You see that all across America. This is a criminal operation. And it's moving from state to state to state, right? So now all of these states come together and they have amassed all of this political wealth. And then they ended up actually going to war with the government. And the last thing I want, I thought was amazing that you mentioned making this crime syndicate and this criminal enterprise connection is that the same way the La Costa Nostra tied a lot of what they did into the Catholic church, but brother Ali talked about how Christianity was what they used to move mm. their criminal enterprise uh, through the country. Mm. So I, was, I thought that was interesting. I'll pass that back to you. Uh, let me, before yeah. you go back in Ali, um, I was reading a bunch of stuff today and I, I came across several different pieces of, of research that show how the, the quote unquote African during the time, the colonial times were viewed. And I think I may, may have mentioned this on the last program that while the European viewed themselves as Christian, they viewed the African here in the colonies as a heathen. So in, in many respects, they weren't privy or, or privileged to have the same rights as, as a Christian has. So that, that's a powerful point you made, Brother Logic, because I've seen that like several times today. Yeah, so um, just about the Christian point, uh, you'll see in some of the colonial charters uh, not all of them, because I don't think Georgia had it in their charter. But the colonial charters, one of the things, one of the main things they talk about is it is is um, establishing the colony for the purpose of advancing Christendom, and um, and educating the savage Indians in the way of the one true God of Christianity. So this is actually in their charters. You could you could you could see this stuff in there, right? So that is very foundational to uh, what they were doing and why they were doing what they were doing. You know what I mean? Um, it, it undergirds everything, right? It, it, it even undergirds their identity uh, early on um, before they created the identity of white. They were identified as Christians, right? All the, most of the documents that you'll see in early colonial America, it, you'll see the people that are now called white actually identified as Christians in the records, right? Not white, right? White comes later, Christian or sometimes Englishman. But uh, in, in any case, um, so when it comes down to the idea of the unconstitutionality of slavery, right? The, these founding documents all have cer certain principles in them, right? And the principle, the main principle that's in contradiction to chattel slavery is the principle of liberty. The principle of liberty, right? This is one of their cornerstone principles, right? And they say that all of their wars were fought over freedom. The, the, the problem is, it's in all of their founding documents, even the Constitution. If you look at the preamble, the preamble to the Constitution talks about liberty, right? And it doesn't say liberty for white people, 
White, as a matter of fact, we mentioned on the last program talking about this, that white is nowhere in the Constitution. Even though, like we, uh, I might have mentioned, during the debates over all of this in the Constitutional Convention, there were people in certain areas who did want the preamble to say, we, the white people of the United States, right? Uh, that was a debate. And the people who wanted that there actually lost that debate. So what the Constitution's preamble actually says is, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility. These are all things that go against chattel slavery. There's nothing just about chattel slavery. There's nothing tranquil for the victims of chattel slavery. Provide for the common defense. Nobody defended the chattel slaves. Promote the gen welfare, no one was concerned with the welfare of the chattel slaves. And secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Now, mind you, right? None of this says that it's specifically for white people. It says we the people. And remember, when we read from the dissenting opinion of uh, Dred Scott, where Justice Curtis speaks about the black people in the states at the time under the Article of Confederation had the rights of suffrage and voted along with the other citizens for the adoption and ratification of the United States Constitution. So it is in contradiction to the actual principles embedded in these founding documents, right? So that goes towards the point that we're trying to make. This is in, in its in its most basic sense, slavery is unconstitutional because it's, in, it's diametrically opposed to all of the principles that, the, that the, this union was built upon. Absolutely. Uh, so to further expose and expound on the hypocrisy, right? We can go into another piece because someone asked a great question. I think it's a good segue into this other information. It was like, uh, has anyone ever challenged or did anyone, you know, ever say that, you know, this was constitutional in the past, right? So we got a couple points you can go to and examples that we can make. So one is you can listen to the Dred Scott argument and go back and research the Dred Scott argument. Uh, uh, Justice Tani is the chief justice at the time. So he's his decision is what's you know remembered and quoted the most. But if you go out and listen to the actual arguments, you will hear a very interesting and compelling and almost parallel argument to what we're presenting tonight out of uh, uh, Justice uh, uh, Curtis. And he's making similar, if not the same exact uh, assertions that you, you, you're you going to be hearing us make. So just because he wasn't the, the chief justice and uh, his opinion was different, it wasn't the prevailing decision. So it doesn't mean he was wrong. doesn't mean Tony was right. It just means whose position and, and how it ended up coming out. But yes, we're not, this is like Ali said earlier, this is not nothing new. We're reminding the present public of, of something that they don't like to talk about, but it's in our history. These things were challenged, right? And so uh, another thing that was challenged, right, to kind of further uh, hit on that point of, of was it ever challenged, there, there was these uh, laws called the Fugitive Slave Act. And I know we've heard of the Fugitive Slave Act, but all the states did not participate or want to participate, but a very interesting debate rose up but uh, and uh, before I go in and really explain these things, there there was a representative from the state of Wisconsin who really looked at fugitive uh, slave act as an unconstitutional law, and I'm going to read what he based that on. But first, I want to um, let's I want us to get a working understanding of a, of two definitions, right? One of what a fugitive is. Keep these things in mind. What is a fugitive? And who is a fugitive? And one is what is can be considered chattel, and, and just like what's the definition of chattel, right? And but uh, before you before you go in, bro, this, if you don't mind, I, I just want to give them the definition of fugitive out of Black's Law, and I want to give them the the definition of fugitive slave law, so you can like really break it down. Absolutely. All right. So this is I'm coming from Black's Law Dictionary. The fifth edition, it says a fugitive is one who flees 
used in criminal law with the implication of flight, evasion, or escape from arrest, prosecution, or imprisonment. Now, in Black's Law Dictionary for Fugitive Slave Law, it says, Acts of Congress passed in 1793 and 1850 prior to abolition of, slave, of slavery, pro providing the surrender and deportation of slaves who escaped from their masters and fled into the territory of another state, generally a free state. Uh, so the uh, that's uh, that's perfect. Keep that in mind, right? So now I want to talk about and introduce another concept about the unconstitutionality of the Fugitive Slave Act. There was a gentleman named Brian Payne, Byron Payne, who was the uh, Chief Justice of Wisconsin, and th listen to what he said about the unconstitutionality of the Fugitive Slave Act and why he felt it was unconstitutional. Uh, let me uh, come out my screen. I'm not on my computer today, family, so just bear with me here. And now, so he says, I shall argue the unconstitutionality of the Fugitive Slave Act upon three grounds. First, that Congress had no power to legislate upon the subject at all. Second, admitting such a power, the act is unconstitutional in providing that any person claimed as a fugitive may be reduced to a state of slavery without a trial by jury. Third, that it is unconstitutional because it vests the judicial power of the, U the, Uni the United States and court commissioners contrary to the provisions of the Constitution. Now, now, Albert, now Brian Payne is making some very interesting assertions against the states and what yes. they're trying to do. It sounds like they're trying to force bootlegging on that state or something <laughs> like that, right? So it, it's it's like keeping the eye, the eye concept. This is something that's actually people do see as criminal and everybody's not in support of this thing. So the, the second reason is one of the more interesting reasons, right? Look at what he says. He says, the act is unconstitutional in providing that any person claimed as a fugitive, any person claimed as a fugitive may be reduced to a state of slavery without trial by jury, right? Everybody knows who we're talking about at this point. And he's saying you cannot make the state of Wisconsin just honor your act of property and men. We don't honor that in this state. We don't recognize that as a legal system in this state. Because surely if it was constitutional, Wisconsin wouldn't have been able to deny them. Then the whole concept would have already been understood, right? When it entered into the union, right? So they would have known what they were entering to. So they said they did not even recognize the justice is saying we don't recognize the slaves as property or anything like that. Now, just a common sense lesson real quick. Let's put some logic into this thing. If they believe that we were property, similar to a cow or a chicken or a horse and that we were not actually human beings, people with human rights and things like that. They let you believe this thing and, they, and, we, and we just go ahead and accept and said, yeah, back then we wasn't even considered a human being. No, yes, we were. Everyone knew what we was, but what happened was criminal. And this is what they did. They stripped that they, they enslaved their own citizens and, uh, and stole citizenship from them broke them, crippled them, crippled their ability to access their citizenship. They held their citizenship perpetually hostage. All right, so now, the property concept. Are, where, did anyone ever consider us actual property realistically? They tell on themselves when they make this Fugitive Slave Act. Because in one Fugitive Slave Act, one came out in the 1700, 17, uh, uh, who got the exact dates? I don't want to misquote. I know there's two different. 1793, right? And then you have another one in, I think, uh, 17, uh, or another one, uh, 1850, right? So, we, uh, Brother Naheem read the definition of chattel and fugitive. Think about that. Now, if we're property and someone really believed that we're the same as their donkey, we're the same as their horse, we're the same as their dog, just ask yourself, if your donkey or your horse or your cow ran away, 
would they ever and could they ever be considered fugitives from justice? Now, can you say and say arrest my cow? It is fugitive. It's a fugitive from justice. Now, I know the one in 1850 calls it a fugitive of labor. Right. Nowhere in these two uh, acts are, do they mention the word slave or slavery. Right. They, they're, they're just coined that they call them that we know them as the fugitive slave acts, but they're really not mentioning the term slavery. They're talking about a fugitive act. It's really called a fugitive act. And uh, they're referring to the violators of this law act as fugitives of, of justice and fugitives of, of labor, right? So can if you're not a man and you're not, then how can you be bound and uh, judged by man's laws and man's justice? If you, if you don't have the concept of, uh, of man's justice, how can it be something that you can even be tried by? So they know you're a man. They know what they're doing, right? It's because they made a law for you and not the donkey. You don't see no fugitive donkey acts running around nowhere, right? <laughs> and, and say that, bring it, bring it back dead or alive. I don't care. Just bring it right. back. Right. They don't right. see right. none of that type of madness. You know what I'm saying? So they know they were yeah. different. It was hypocrisy. It was a criminal operation being spread through the United States of America. And it got so out of hand that they had to fight a whole bloody war about it. But this thing at its core is a was a criminal enterprise ran by nefarious monsters. This is just the, the reality of what right. happened. You know what I mean? So uh, it got and, but, but history don't tell it the tale like that. It just, you know, because of, you know, you still got some a lot of the benefactors you know, and some of the other things that took place that we've talked about in this show time and time again have happened. Their descendants are still out here moving. So we got to be out here moving as reparationists, bringing this history out, bringing this reframing, taking our narrative back, t telling it like it really is and how we've lived it and how our family has lived it. You know, we can't keep letting people give us like we have to have that that Douglas and uh, uh, his uh, mentor moment and say, you know what? You, you, I, I, you, I understand what you're saying, but I disagree. This is what this is just what you have told me so long, right? This is what you told me, but now I'm doing my own research. I'm doing, I'm, I'm smart enough and I'm mature enough to look at this thing and analyze it with my own understanding and lived experience and say no, and your own intelligence say no. This, this, this Constitution don't. Somebody told me on Twitter that the thanks for bringing it up because they thought the con the institution of slavery was at the core of the Constitution. And I say, no, brother, no, man. You know, so I'm glad we're doing this program tonight. I, I throw it back to uh, the panel. All right, definitely. Uh, brother Josh, if you wanted to add on, I, I, and when you do, I want to go back to what Frederick Douglass said for those of you who missed the beginning. Okay, I, I want to go back to what Frederick Douglass said for those of you who missed the beginning. And then I want to read from the second part a, a short excerpt to also solidify what Frederick Douglass said and what my brother Logic just so eloquently broke down. Um, if you're watching from Facebook, come on over to the YouTube channel. We are ending the live stream on Facebook. If you're watching from Twitter, we're gonna leave those up. So, you know, like I said, we're trying to drive the traffic over to the YouTube channel. So I, I wanna read from I want to read from the Frederick Douglass piece again real quick. And then I want to go into the unconstitutionality of slavery. All right. Because this is, this is, um, this goes with exactly what my brother logic was just saying. Okay. Frederick Douglass, as after reading, um, Okay, wait a minute. I just lost it. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Okay, there it goes. There we go. Okay, so after reading uh, the Declaration of Independence, Frederick Douglass gives a breakdown of, of what he read. And, and one of those breakdowns is the objects here set forth are six in number, union, defense, welfare, tranquility, justice, and liberty. These are all good objects, and slavery, so far from being among them, is a foe of them all. But it has been said that Negroes are not included within the benefits sought under this declaration. 
This is said by slaveholders in America. It is said by the city hall orator, but it is not said by the constitution itself. Hmm. It is not said by the constitution itself. Its language is, quote unquote, we the people, not we the white people, not even we the citizens, not we the privileged class, not we the high, not we the low, but we the people, not we the horse, sheep and swine and wheelbarrows, you know, property that things own, but we the people, we the human inhabitants. So I want to go to the unconstitutionality of slavery. Um, let me know if y'all can hear like some feedback in my microphone. I'm I'm hearing it in my ear for whatever reason. Can y'all hear any feedback? No, no? you good. Hmm. Okay. Um. I, I want to read this real quick, and I, I want my brothers to come in and expound on it. Um. This is chapter thirteen. I believe this is book two of. Spooner's unconstitutionality of slavery, if I'm not mistaken. All right. The children of slaves are born free. The idea that the children of slaves are necessarily born slaves or that they necessarily follow that natural law of property, which gives the natural increase of property to the owner of the original stock is an, is an erroneous one. It is a principle of natural law in regard to property that a calf belongs to the owner of the cow that bore it, fruit to the owner of the tree or vine on which it grew, and so on. But the principle of natural law, which makes a calf belong to the owner of the cow, does not make the child of a slave belong to the owner of the slave. And why? simply because both cow and calf are naturally subjects of property, while neither men nor children are naturally subjects of property. The law of nature gives no aid to anything inconsistent with itself. It therefore gives no aid in the transmission of property in man. While it does give aid to the transmission of property in other animals and in things, Brute animals and things being naturally subjects of property, there are obvious reasons why the natural increase should belong to the owner of the original stock. But men, not being naturally subjects of property, the law of nature will not transmit any right of property acquired in violation of her own authority. Now, there are so many different ways that we can tackle this. You could look at the biblical narrative where um, the God of the Bible says that he gave Adam dominion over the beasts of the field and, and all of the living things, et cetera, et cetera. Well, if that's the case, then it is impossible for man, any man to be included in this dominion. We find the same thing in the Quran. We find the same thing in our Moorish pamphlet called Circle Seven, where man is the Lord of things made manifest or, or the uh, plane of things made manifest. So when we are looking at the constitutionality of slavery and when the United States of America becomes an actual country, then we understand that it is an import that went against what the Declaration of Independence said when it spoke about the inalienable rights of human beings, life, liberty, freedom, and the pursuit of happiness. So I want my brothers to come in and, and you know, I, I, you know, my brother Logic really went in on, on that element, but I want, you know, I just want some more context as we move this particular conversation forward because we see today that a cop can shoot us down with impunity. I'm in a group right now with a bunch of races. Oh my gosh, man. This is the craziest thing I probably have. Any debates I probably ever had, Josh, all the brothers are in the group with me. But this is, yeah, just, in there with you. yeah this is what <laughs> this, but what I'm doing is I'm, taking the temperature, like I'm doing a, a psychoanalysis of these people's minds and their thought process 
starting from a book you hear us mention often on this platform called The Bloody Shirt and today's thinking. And in today's thinking, these people still hold a dominant paternalistic view over us, or at least they believe that they should hold that view, which is why they feel that they could gun us down, murder us, that uh, we shouldn't have any justice, that if a cop kills one of us, then the first thing that should happen is we should look to see if this person had a criminal record. So instead of saying, yeah, the cops killed that innocent man, the racists in America, the former slaveholders, the descendants of the slaveholders say, yeah, but he was a criminal. So basically he deserved to die then. So I want you know, I wanted my brothers to come in and chime in on that element and, and, and really break it down. I just I, I I'm just uh, and what's re what's really interesting to me is when you when you see it moving through later on I'm uh two minutes after I say this piece I'm I'm gonna read something interesting from that book that we talk about all the time right uh the bloody shirt and I'm gonna show like how this thing was put into the 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 legal language. You can see the the crime and all of the intentions in it, and so then when they really talk about the real hypocrisy, you can see it in these uh, in the Reconstruction Constitutional Convention statements and stuff of the of uh, in the Reconstruction era. And I'm gonna read something from a, a, a Governor Perry of South Carolina, a provisional governor, in, later on, and and it's gonna kind of really confirm a lot of the things that are being said. Uh, that that Ali said and that uh, Abba just said, you're going to see this stuff being on the actual record, right, of how they're extending, because we all know all but the military battle, the South won the war. And that's how you really see us go from private bondage into public subjugation. And when they just really remix, they put the 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 uh, 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 in, uh, chattel slavery remix on us. Right. And they and they made it legal. That that's the biggest thing they did. They turned that's the, the reconst they had they fought the war, but the over overthrowing of Reconstruction was when they really won. They made the whole entire institution legal with policies and the way they did it was masterful. It was yeah, I, was I was just finna get in. I was just gonna say that. Yeah, go ahead. No, I, we see this book by Los Angeles Spooners came out, I think, 1845. So he is arguing against the un unconstitutionality of slavery. Then and before then, you know, as it, as it comes to um, as regards to the United States of America and the Constitution, then, but of course, after the Civil War, we see with the Thirteenth Amendment, they slipped that that clause in there that um, is the reason why you still see people today um, referring to themselves as abolitionists because they because we're looking at that involuntary servitude clause in the Thirteenth Amendment as mm. slavery. So I, I think what, you know, I don't want people to get confused. We're not trying to say that we're trying to, we're, we're talking about how slavery has always been unconstitutional, but how they have used involuntary servitude to substitute for slavery. Um, and, and you see the rise in when private prisons hit, you see how the prison population went through the ceiling. So now it's, it's a way of making that unconstitutional institution a part of the Constitution. That's what I wanted to add as That's context. Right. Definitely, That's right, definitely. Bro. That's exactly right. Um, you know, um, it was like a double-edged sword, right? The 13th Amendment, interesting, interesting amendment. It's a double-edged sword. It ended the institution of chattel slavery, but it made it so that Slavery as an institution is something that was then going to be controlled by the state, right? And so they use the term slavery. They use the term involuntary servitude. You know, it's this, and there's arguments being made by you know that we we go back and forth with people. We're not going to mention them today again, but they say that involuntary servitude is not the same thing as child slavery. We're going to, and. and they're, like there's the argument there, but the way they're using it and the way they did use it, especially directly after the passage of the 13th Amendment, they used it for the same 
<laughs> if you look at how convict leasing was when they worked you to the bone, because the private bondage, you had an interest in keeping the slave alive, keeping the slave relatively healthy and productive, right? But mm -hmm. under the subjugation, there was not that incentive because now, you know, you, they just leased you out. They can just work you to the ground. They just go pick up some more Negroes and go and put them to work and work them to the bone. And you build a mass grave. They don't care. They, they don't want you around anyway. And then you look at you look at, under the child slavery system. You know they needed you alive because they could even even um, take out mortgages against you. They can they can take out loans and put you as collateral. Well, that wasn't happening in the prison system. You know under under convict leasing or or today. So if you look at it from the terms of how they. How they really did us, man, with that, with that Thirteenth Amendment, with that clause, and how they, how they used that to make another system that was able to allow them to, like, live out the rest of the the, the cotton rush, you know, the of maximizing the productivity and, and the profitability from cotton, tobacco, and other things, railroads, and building the industry mm -hmm. in America. You know, it's really, it's really dirty. But again, it just I mean. We're old in debt, man. I'm just that's just what yeah. that's what I understand. All of this that we're talking about, you just want to add so many different weapons to your belt when people come to talk to you and all kind of crazy. Because see what Naheem was talking about, and I'm not gonna take too much more time from now because you dropping the you dropping the official knowledge. But what Naheem was talking about in the group we in, man, <laughs> but <laughs> these people ignorant as hell. These people, they just feel like they can just say whatever to you. It doesn't matter about all these things that we went through. See, the stuff that we're dealing with is our family dealing. Like our, this happened to our blood relatives. Like we can, we get stories. I get stories about these things happening to my family. But if you have people in this group who want to just throw that in the trash, say, "Shut up, Negroes," just because you want welfare. Shut up. You just, mm -hmm. Lazy. I'm trying to get a couple of them to come on tomorrow night. I haven't had nobody committed. I had somebody said, I got somebody for you. They'll clean your clock. So I'm waiting for them. <laughs> I'm waiting for them to get back at me. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, hey, I just wanted to just even vent because, you know, hey, look, part of it is target practice. You know, I, nobody can touch us in that group. But see, when they have numbers, when you get overwhelming numbers of people who just don't even care about the facts and don't care, they just want, they want to cloak themselves like they care, like they have some type of legitimacy of what they're saying. And they'll quote a Candace Owens or a Brandon Tatum or a, what, was the, what was the professor's name? The old, old uh, super um, Uncle Ruckus dude from the, the uh, professor, big time professor, uh, Thomas Powell, and the other the other dude that used to smoke crack. What was his name? And they want to quote him and all these people. Mm -hmm. Yo, <laughs> these people they they just man, they just the worst devils ever walked. <laughs> and they that would never bad. face us. Oh they yes, they would yeah. never face us. Look, and, but what I, what what Abba was explaining is the mindset that you, in order to really understand a mindset, you got to get this book right here. You got to get the bloody shirt, and you got to read this because it's like being in a time machine. They're saying the same exact stuff that you <laughs> we heard during Reconstruction. That we like, they're saying the same exact arguments, and. I wanted to read something from this book. You got to get this book. I want to read two things before we get off of here. But uh, right now, just just look at this. The, the 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 criminal enterprise is going federal. It's going legal. Andrew Johnson. I know everyone who is up to date with this political maturity right now knows Andrew Johnson, worst president in America. What he did, right? Unconstitutional brother. So even all of this stuff that comes after and makes, you know. The, the 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 reconstruction and all that even happened is some unconstitutional stuff as well it's just unconstitutionality upon unconstitutionality upon unconstitutionality so just re bear with me for one second let me show you the type of unconstitutional the continual unconstitutional acts and stuff crimes and how far they went and how they kept going so we know we had the civil war we know that there was a uh, 14th amendment and all these other amendments that ended up being produced but just let's let's think about this this is the stuff andrew johnson did right during the reconstruction of the united states of america it says the delegates 
to the Constitution included 12 men who had served as delegates to South Carolina's Succession Convention in 1860. Among them were the Sessions, uh, among them were the Sessions Convention president and the man who had introduced the motion for succession. Several ex-Confederate generals and an ex-Confederate senator and South Carolina's first Confederate governor were present too. So, so was the state's provisional governor, Benjamin F. Perry. Research this man, right? He was a pre-war unionist who had opposed succession for fear it would endanger slavery, but then had rallied to the Confederate cause and served in South Carolina's Confederate legislature. This man's at the very top of Confederate business and has a little bit of uh, kind of traitor in him looking like, like he is on both sides of this thing, a unionist, Confederate, right? Accepting uh, terms from a federal government, Perry had been pre uh, pleasantly surprised when President Johnson gave him the appointment as provisional governor and made clear he intended to leave the job of organizing the new state's government entirely in the hands of what white Southerners like to call the natural ruling element mm. of their <laughs> of, the, of the natural <laughs> ruling element of their society. The president asked Perry just to write occasionally and let him know how he was getting. And, you know, let me just know how you're going, how everything's going, man. Just write me a letter. He's basically he just put his cousin like, all right, <laughs> take care of that. Let me know how you, uh, how's it going if you need any help with that thing, right? So the new governor, listen, look at what, like, they got straight to business. They didn't waste no time. The new governor's, this is in South Carolina, y'all. The new governor's first official act was to issue a proclamation reappointing all Confederate officials to the position they had held in the state government at the time of the surrender. So that let me let me just kind of uh, <laughs> tell you the gravity of this thing, right? That's like you know the the, the Nazis losing the the war, then like they just take their uniforms off and then they get put right back and they because Hitler become the governor, you know what I'm saying? You know Heimler and him, all of them is still right there. They getting back governor and then they go put all the Gestapo and all of the SS and everybody back in power. They just uh, just like that. These this is this is how fast this is happening. Right, this is just a couple years after the bloodiest war in America, right? And then you just, John, Andrew Johnson just puts one of these Confederate, former Confederates who was all the way up at the top, he was in the Confederate legislature, puts him as the governor, just appoints him, no democracy, nobody voted for him, put him right in uh, as the governor during such a crucial time, right? And then right where the out of the most of our, not even gonna say most, but a great amount of our uh, ADOS heroes come from South Carolina. Y'all better understand and, and read that state. Just, just let me get the uh, the rest of this out real quick because it, it's really important. It says, in his opening address to the convention, Perry made quick, quick work of the freedmen, our ancestors. It was the delegates' unavoidable duty to, uh, he instructed them, however painful it may be to adopt a declaration of affirming that slavery will never again exist within the borders of the state. He's He's putting it to he's 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 mourning about he got to put this thing called slavery to bed, right? So he hey, says. Bro, what, uh, what, what, mm -hmm. Let me ask you real quick: what year? What year was this taking place? If you know, this is uh, eighteen sixty-five, right? This wow! Is right after I want, the war. I'm gonna right? say something. You finish reading. I'm gonna say something about it. Mm hmm. This is this is right after the war. This is. So I'm, I'm going to get right. It's, it's, it's like not, it's like six weeks after the assassination. These type of things are taking place like, well, six weeks after Johnson comes in and gets, you know, all the transition of power. This is the stuff he does immediately after start making these type of appointments and whatnot. Right. So let me get finished with this so you can bring bring up your point. Right. It says that. Uh, so after they. Uh, Forever the abolitionists by the war making powers of the United States military authorities, it was likely that three quarters of the states would soon ratify the 13th Amendment, thereby making abolition the supreme law of the land. 
it was a necessary condition for South Carolina's re readmission to the union that their state include a like declaration in their state's new constitution. Until this is done, we shall be kept under military rule and the Negroes will be protected as freedmen, our ancestors, right? By the whole military force of the United States. This is what Governor Perry is saying in his opening address. But to, but to be no longer a slave in no way made the Negro a citizen, Perry hastened to add. The radicals in the North who were already saying that there should be no distinction between voters on account of color forget that this is a white man's government intended for white men only. Perry, that's, this is what Perry, Governor Perry, new Governor Perry, look at this venom he's bringing <laughs> into the reconstruction. Like this is some real venom stuff, right? To speak of extending political equality to the Negro was nothing but folly and madness. A few months later, it had become folly, injustice and madness. Uh, he, uh, the African has been in all ages a savage or a slave. Perry declared this. God created him inferior to the white man in form, color, and intellect. And no legislation or culture can make him his equal. You might as well ex expect to make the fox the equal to the lion in courage and strength, or the ass the equal to the horse in symmetry and fleetingness. His color is black, his head covered with wool instead of hair, his form and features will not compare to, with the Caucasian race. And it is in vain to think of elevating him to the dignity of the white man. God has created a difference between the two races and nothing can make him equal. This is Governor Perry, y'all. <laughs> the governor. Right after Reconstruction, <laughs> right after we thought we won and we got emancipated, this is who America made our governor. No democracy involved. Just appointed this monster. This read like something out of a horror film. All of that is in the minutes of the con of the Constitutional Convention in the state of uh, North Carolina, I mean, South Carolina. This is what was said. This is like horror movie type stuff. This is this is our history. So when you get people that come over here and try to say, forget all of that, like that didn't matter, you have to feel some type of way about that. As a reparationist, you need to understand this is something different. No one has ever, it's not about no oppression Olympics. We talking about a criminal operation. And every day we don't get justice yeah. is another crime in progress. So. Ali, you want to talk about you? Let's talk about uh, before. But all right, real quick, well, real I, quick, I, real quick. I, I just, I just have to say this. Listening to my brother Logic read that, I, I conjured up from my own teachings when Noble Drew Ali tell us to look into the history of the Moors. It was one of the last and greatest empires that we ever had. It gave the world algebra and trigonometry and three course mills and cleanliness and raised sidewalks and street lights and high forms of civilization and poetry, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I just, I had to interject that because that governor was lying. And anybody that feels that way today, like your Richard Spencer's and, and the rest of them alt-right guys, they're liars, point blank period. Go, go ahead, Josh, and just swing it to Ali. Yeah, I just wanted to share something real quick. I shared this one time before, but can you bring my screen up? Yeah, look, all right. So when we want to talk about Andrew Johnson giving people their property back and, and restore, this is one of my ancestors. I want you guys to understand. This is one of my ancestors, my people from Brunswick County, Virginia. Okay, um, you know, both I'm ADOS on both sides of my family, my mother and my father, both or go all the way back as far as you can go to America. And my mom's side go back as far as you can go in Virginia. Um, and this is one of the slave owners or slave masters who thought it was constitutional. It didn't care. He didn't give a damn if it was constitutional or not to own uh, my, my great, great, great grandmother. And so, uh, you know, he was a rape he, she was a rape victim of him. And that's how my, my lineage is here today. 
on on coming from that particular end. But this is actually a a letter he received from Andrew Johnson. And it's funny because when I originally read this, um, I read it. I got it. The day that I got it and the day that I read it, I was going to share it, but it was actually the the same exact day. I think it was July the 29th. Yeah, July the 29th. I just wanted to to show you all. This is real. He should not have gotten his property back. He should not. He was a he did business for the Confederacy. He had joined his his grandfather actually renounced uh, his grandfather signed the ordinance for Virginia to secede, I mean, to sign, sign the succession papers for Virginia to secede from the Union. His grandfather actually was the first case of um, contrabands of war to where three of, before it was Hampton, Virginia, it was Point, uh, point of Old point old Comfort or something like that. And there was a Fort, Fort Monroe right by that. So three of his slaves got in a boat and they, they you know, so they, um, they navigated to Fort Monroe and they got to, they got free of him. So he charged, this is another guy, his, this grandfather, this guy, he went to um, Fort Monroe and demanded that his property be returned. And they said, nah, you know, you're in rebellion. So, um, you know, we got this confiscation that going on. So now we've confiscated your property. Then there are contrabands of war. You, you don't get nothing back. And so now those people were, were actually enslaved by the army until emancipation. So I just wanted to show you, like, this is not something that is, is hearsay. This is an actual family story. This is that this is real. I got the papers in front of me right here. So I just want to, and if anybody, you know, just sign up for Ancestor, you'd be, you'd be real surprised. Even if you got to do the free trial for a little while, mm-hmm. get the documents, you'd be surprised what you find on Ancestry.com. Yeah, that was powerful. That was powerful, yeah. brother Ali. Yeah, um, I just want to go back a little bit to um, a question that someone asked about challenging the constitutionality of slavery in court. Um, on one of the previous ep- episodes, we brought up one of the cases known as the freedom cases in uh, Massachusetts. Um, this woman known as Elizabeth Freeman challenged the constitutionality of slavery um, based on her knowledge of the Declaration of Independence and what the Declaration of Independence said and what her state constitution said at the time. And uh, she actually won her suit as a so-called Negro slave who was able to take the white owner to court, win her suit, be compensated uh, in exchange as well as have her court fees paid. Um, so that was one instance, there were others but that was one in particular that's kind of um that's somewhat uh, known. I won't say it's a famous case. Also, Josh brought up um, a couple of terminology. I think people need to be uh uh, uh um he mentioned slave owner and slave um what was the other term he said slave owner and slave master master. Right, yeah, those are two different things. They're not necessarily one and the same, right? A slave owner could be someone who owns a slave and leases the slave out to a slave master, right? The a slave master doesn't necessarily have to be a slave owner. So I just it, it just came to mind when I brought it up. And so let me let me do this, right? I want to read something from the unconstitutionality of slavery. This is from uh, the chapter. This this chapter is chapter eight called the Constitution of the United States. All right, so this is something that he said that I think is very, very relevant to what we're saying in terms of making the case for the unconstitutionality of, the, of, of, uh, of slavery. He says this, the Constitution of the United States at its adoption certainly took effect upon and made citizens of all the people of the United States who were not slaves under the state's constitution, right? That's obvious. No one can deny a proposition so self-evident as that. If then the state constitutions then existing authorized no slavery at all, the constitution of the United States took effect upon and made citizens of all the people of the United States 
without discrimination. And if all the people of the United States were made citizens of the United States by the United States Constitution at its adoption, it was then forever too late for the state governments to reduce any of them to slavery. They were thenceforth citizens of a higher government under a constitution that was the quote unquote supreme law of the land. Anything in the constitution or laws of the states to the contrary notwithstanding. This is a powerful statement that he's making here. If the state governments could enslave citizens of the United States, the state constitutions and, the, and not the constitution of the United States would be the supreme law of the land. For no higher act of supremacy can be exercised by one government over another than that of taking the citizens of the latter out of the protection of their government and reducing them to slavery. I hope, did y'all understand what he was saying there? Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, so yo, go ahead, brother. No, I was just gonna say this is this is a powerful, powerful statement based on the fact that he knew that at the time of the adoption of the United States Constitution, none of the state constitutionalized the institution of, of, of slavery. Neither did any of the charters, the state, uh, the the colonial charters prior to that. Neither did the Articles of Confederation. So if nothing authorized this. He's saying that when the Constitution was adopted, it made everybody who was on the land at that time under the sovereignty of the United States, citizens of the United States. And then it was too late. Once that happened, it was too late for any state law or state constitution to then turn around and enslave the people who were made citizens by the Constitution. Because if that was the case, then that means the states were actually superior to the, to the federal government. Yes, and yes, exactly. It, that that is what the entire fight has always been about: the the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. And what he just broke down was so important because what what they're doing is like the the, the very people that were fighting next to you one day, right? to actually make America possible, then you're going to say a, a few years uh, right after that, yeah, we can enslave them too. They're not human beings. We don't know who they are. They're just property. Like, we didn't just pop out of nowhere. We literally was just fighting the war to make America with you. So there, you knew that I was not. This is the criminality of it all. You knew that I was not that, and you did that to me. But everybody wasn't in agreement with it because you see states that didn't go along with it. And that's how you get the divide in the first place. And then they in this fight and this crime, who was going to continue the crime? And some people said, we're not going to do it like that no more. And others did it. And they continued it. And it was criminal and it was unconstitutional. That's why you don't see it. But you see it being tolerated. You see it being uh, 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 helped and aided. Right. It's nothing legal about it. It's illegal. Well, it's, it's nothing lawful about it, right? They, then they said, you know what? We got so juiced up. We'll just start making our own laws about it. So they started passing unconstitutional laws, right? But until it gets raised and challenged and deemed unconstitutional, you can benefit off a thing. To understand that, right? Because you're like, what do we mean? How is that possible? You see states right now, several states, marijuana, 100% legal, right? 100% totally decriminalized and uh, recreation in this full pop and you got your growth fields, you got, you got everything. The states are doing what they want to do. That's an expression of federalism. That's an expression of states' rights. They're doing what they want. But there's nothing constitutional legalizing the industry of marijuana right now. There's nothing on the federal books that's saying that this is a legal thing. So at any time, the federal government, if they wanted, it, wanted to, could go in there and shut all of them down, right? So and they could, arrest, they could arrest a whole bunch of people and selling marijuana, purchasing marijuana. And, and first, that's an excellent analogy. And two, that has already happened. Yes. I believe in Colorado, it was a story done on that like two years ago. Yeah, and, and, and the point I'm making is because what are they doing though? Why don't we see a whole bunch of that, a lot of that happening? Because they're tolerating it. Why? Because of the financial mm -hmm. interest. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a finance. There's a lot of hands in this. So, you know, I'm a I'm a, a, a senator from Texas or or uh, wherever. You know what I mean? And, uh, from California. 
better state, right? Better state selection. I'm from I'm, I'm a senator from California. My my cousin and my they got growth is they got they're investing in this thing with money, with real money. They're involved. So they going up to Capitol Hill saying, you know what? Uh I'm not I'm not, I don't I'm he's not finna uh you know what I mean go against his a system that's making his state thrive like that. So this is how we you can compare and start getting a real understanding of how slavery went from a illegitimate system, right? And it is it, it, to a legitimate system, but it was an unconstitutional uh, unconstitutional enterprise and criminal operation the whole entire time. Indeed. I want to I want to come to Man, this is a couple of things I want to get to. I'm not going to get to all of it because it ties in to tonight's topic. So I'm trying to, all right, I'm, I'm going to go with this first. I wanted to read something, you know, just dealing with our votes before, our voting before the passage of the 14th or the 15th Amendment. But, but what I want to do is I, I want to go here. I, I want to go here real quick. This is from the Bouvier's Law Dictionary in 1892. <clears throat> it says, Negroes born within the United States are entitled to vote under the 14th Amendment and are protected therein by the Act of May 31st, 1870. So I, 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 had up, I had to look up what this act was. And so... And when I looked it up, it just you know, everybody knows I'm a Moorish American. I, I follow I follow Prophet Noble Drew Ali and the things that he said about the 14th and 15th Amendments not being necessary for the salvation of our people or, or citizens. He didn't just like confine it to our people. So I, I found the act, right? And the name of this act, May 31st, 1870, is an act to enforce the right of, of citizens of the United States to vote in the several states of this union and for other purposes. I'm not going to read. I'll just read the first section. Be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America and Congress assemble that all citizens of the United States who are or shall be otherwise qualified by law to vote at any election by the people in any state, territory, district, county, city, parish, township, school, district, municipality, or other territorial subdivision shall be entitled and allowed to vote at all such elections without distinction of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Any constitution, law, you custom, usage, or regulation of any state or territory or by or under its authority to the contrary, notwithstanding. Now, I think that that was a powerful piece of legislation, right? But it, it brought me back to the fact, and we've touched on this on prior programs, that if we, and this was noted by Abraham Lincoln, this was noted by the dissenters in Scott v. Sanford, which is um, Justice Curtis and Justice McLean, that in at least five northern states, our people were eligible to vote, and, and they did vote. They exercised the elective franchise, the suffrage rights of other citizens in this nation. They helped vote in the signatories of the Articles of Confederation, which becomes the United States Constitution. In effect, these quote-unquote Negroes, using that old term to identify us, voted in these representatives that signed the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution of the United States of America. We've read as much on this particular platform coming out of uh, the congressional record debates. My brother Ali and I have went over that. I can't remember which year that debate happened, but I wanted to bring that up because you you got the 13th Amendment, it frees us from our bondage in the southern states where we were still bonded, where we were still slaves. Then you pass the 14th Amendment because the 14th Amendment has to basically define who is a citizen. But 
if only citizens can vote in the United States of America, as Justice Curtis, as Abraham Lincoln repeating Justice Curtis had already shown, then well, they were already citizens, like we've been citizens from day one. Then how do you get the 15th Amendment, right? Because we already voted. We already voted. But now you have to have the passage of the 15th Amendment. And so we think that it stops there. So obviously states are not honoring the 15th Amendment. And so now we have to get a whole new act, the an act to enforce the right of citizens of the United States to vote in the several states of this union and for other purposes. Then we get the Civil Rights Act in 1965. Then we get the Voting Rights Act. Like America has never done right by us as a whole. There may have been pockets of people. There may have been individual groups who took abolition, abolitionism serious. But as a whole, America has never really done right by us. And this is why what we're teaching here tonight, we dedicate to the fight for reparations. And, some, and the brother put in the chat about the abolition of the loophole in the 13th Amendment, which is tantamount to legal slavery today, whereas they've made up charges and locked us up, similar to what happened with of the vagrancy laws back in the day. They could literally roll up on you and say, do you have any ID? Like, no. <laughs> Where do you live? I I'm homeless, sir. Come on, we got to lock you up. Put you in a chain gang and pay you a penny a day. A penny a day. People were dying in these mines, et cetera, et cetera. So I wanted to bring it back to that because in, in our push for reparations, it is also our duty as reparationists to make sure that we understand. I, I don't want to say all of the history, but it, at least most of we have to understand all of the history. I, I'm saying we not saying we know all of the history, but all of the things that we come across so that when it's time for us to put our footprint on whatever bill is passed for slave uh, reparations for America's descendants of slavery, we are already prepared. So I, I just wanted to add that. Let, let me say, I want to say a couple of things. Um, the um, criminalization of, of uh, with the vagrancy laws in particular, that's something that, you know, you can actually find that in your Articles of Confederation where they accept vagabonds and paupers from the rights and privileges and immunities of the citizens of the several states. You find that right there where, you know, they basically criminalize people for being poor or for being wanderers or for not having a, a, an established uh, residence. The, um, the other thing I wanted to bring up because uh, I, I see uh, uh, the 13th Amendment was uh, brought up in that clause. If you could share this screen I want, us, I want us to look at the actual text because I want us to be clear about what the 13th Amendment is saying so that people understand what exactly is what took place, right, with the abolishing of chattel slavery. So it says here that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for a crime where the party shall have been duly convicted. Uh, I can't see it because you put the thing on it. <laughs> <laughs> convicted shall exist within the United States or any place. Um, where is it at? Hold on one second, bro. Or any place subject to their jurisdiction, right? Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for a crime. So what they did with this particular provision was make an exception for slavery and involuntary servitude, right? Because they're not necessarily the same thing. Right, slavery. If we look at what a slave is, is is, is uh, someone who's owned, right? A slave is someone who's owned. Let's, let's let's be real clear about it. So, a slave is a person who is the legal property of another and is forced to obey. That's the that's the definition coming out of Oxford, right? The Oxford Dictionary tells you it's a person who is a, the legal property of another and is forced to obey 
voluntary servitude is dealing with the labor that that enslaved person is going to be forced to uh, endure. So what they did with this particular amendment was make an exception for slavery and involuntary servitude uh, for people who are convicted and incarcerated within the prison system in the United States. So I just want I just wanted to make sure that people understand that and, and understand that chattel the, the the individual ownership of a person was transferred to the to the perspective of the state actually being in in control of individuals only. Right? It's not that that was the first time that that was happening because you always had you you had prison you had jails and stuff like that already before the 13th amendment so this was already taking place but what they did was they made it exclusive to the state where individuals could no longer um put people in that particular status so i just wanted to say that because i wanted it to be clear you know and i, I saw a couple of people raise the 13th amendment the issue of that yeah. And I wanted to say, you know, I'm glad you brought up the distinction and I'm glad you brought up the actual text of the amendment because that's something I should have done when I was describing it. You kind of read my mind there, but um, I'm reading the chat and um, and, and I see brother, uh, yeah. I believe it's yeah. brother Maximus Parthus, um, and he was saying, I repeat, 13th Amendment legally and constitutionally allows prisoner duly to, convicted to be slaves. The term is used, slavery and indentured service. I think he means voluntary servitude. And um, of slavery in practice today has resulted in the largest prison population on earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, um, I, I think the reason we brought up the distinction though is between uh, slavery and involuntary servitude. And I'm glad you said that slavery is actually the ownership of somebody. When you're owning somebody and then the voluntary servitude is the action. So kind of that's why when you read in Darity's book, um, um, when he talks about the period when we went from private bondage to public subjugation, understand that the reason why they don't say slavery is because they already got you in public subjugation. So the involuntary servitude is just the labor that you do under the, prop, um, the public subjugation, which is when the public owns you or the prison system owns you, they don't necessarily, they don't really technically own you, but they have your, they own your body, they own your person, they have your, possess their person in their possession. And then they say, well, it's legal for them to institute involuntary servitude on your person. That's kind of, and essentially it's slavery, but it's just a slick way of doing it to where they, they don't get to call it slavery. Yes, that that that's so amazing, right? This is so deep, right? So what we is what we really are describing, right, is how the Thirteenth Amendment, and 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 fo follow me with this. The Thirteenth Amendment was used as a the transitioning tool to create the the system to turn private bondage into public subjugation. It created the framework. But let's 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 stop and think what was going on at this time right lincoln was still alive at this time who were so they're creating a we don't know who this thing ultimately is going to be for yet right we don't know who this is going to be for yet this could be for you know people who are uh, in crimes against uh, you know federal acts like you know uh going to war against the union mm -hmm. you know what I mean? <laughs> starting a whole like we don't know that right but what we do know is they killed lincoln right mm -hmm. then they put their boy andrew johnson in See, they, they couldn't they couldn't stop the 13th Amendment, because, but they saw what was in it. This is what they was. They was like, whoa, this thing could get slippery. If we commit a crime, we could be reduced to uh, 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 slavery. But they but they, it was a real slick language that it had to be put in. Right. So now they kill Link. They assassinate the president. They put Andrew Johnson in. I just read the type of people Andrew Johnson was appointing to governors to the Confederates. I just showed you how the, the when the when the when the uh, provisional governors were appointed, they put all the ex Confederates back in the general assemblies, right? And so what they did was they created the laws that were going to be brought that they were going to ensure were going to be broken so that they could own the service of the emancipated freedmen. <laughs> they sat back and they plotted like, okay, we gonna come up with a way we will not lose. I, he declared it. I just read it, and the brothers prove it. Governor Perry declared it. He said we have to you know, acknowledge this in our state uh, constitution in order to be readmitted. But don't fret. We ain't going to never let them 
ever experienced no equality. He said that to the letter. You can go look the speech up, right? And I just read it, right? This is his this is his opening address as being the provisional governor. Said we ain't gonna, and then you see the black codes come. You see the convict leasing it show up so where now the convicts can be leased out to the same plantations that they was just got freed from a year ago, a couple years ago. You back work in the same plantation. This is the worst nightmare that anyone could even dream of dreaming that our family lived through. And they want to tell you, forget about that. You fought a whole blood, the bloodiest war in history to be free. You thought you had your freedom. They killed the president, put a monster in his seat, and he put all the other monster homies in charge of what you thought was your new destiny in America. And they're going to tell you to forget about that. And that any immigrant that come over here, who no matter that, how hard they jo their journey was, they're equal to that experience. Everybody gets to be equal to that experience. You don't get to jump in this thing and, and say, we need to just go ahead and forget about that. This is the most diabolical thing that has ever happened. And I'm not, it's not just my, well, this is not a new opinion. So before I give it back, I want to read this. That, that reconstruction thing was the worst nightmare, right? And I'm going to read this, right? In 1879, an enthused Albion Torje, an Ohio born man who, as a state judge in North Carolina, had fearlessly defended the rights of the common man, colored and white man who had defied Ku Klux Klan threats and the sneers of the conservative bar when he impaneled African-Americans on juries and fined lawyers for saying nigger in his courtroom and gave a rueful, rueful and weary interview to the New York Times, right? This is what he said to the New York Times. This is Albion Torje. He was a judge. He worked in the, on the Plessy versus Ferguson case as well. Uh, this is what he had to say. In all except the actual results of the physical struggle, I consider the South to have been the real victors in the war. I am filled with admiration and amazement at the masterly way in which they have brought about this result. The way in which they have neutralized the results of the war and reversed the verdict of Appomattox is the grandest thing in American politics. He said, uh, amazement because such an outcome was not inevitable or foreordained. Because in the end, Reconstruction did not fail, but was overthrown with impunity and audacity in one of the bloodiest, darkest, and still least known chapters of American history. And he's talking about that reconstruction, y'all. So uh, with that, like, you got to understand when you when you when you see what we really are going through. This is your history. Again, this book is the bloody shirt. There's a lot of good uh, primary source references in here. So you can just really see how uh, wicked and criminal <laughs> this uh, reconstruction actually ended up being with the overthrowing is the that some people refer to it as the second civil war. Redemption. So, and, yeah. They called so, it the uh, redemption after they started slaughtering our people after uh Rikish. Yo, this stuff is crazy. So yeah, so and, and you know, the book, well, I think we got the sources in the description about a lot of the sources we came from, the uh unconstitutional let me ask you question. of slavery. Okay, yeah, let me ask you a question. Do you do you have the unconstitutionality of uh the fugitive slave clause? Do you have that pulled up? Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, I got it pulled up. You want me to read something out of that? Yeah, there was something on, in there about um, the way the courts, unless you read it already, something about the way the courts were set up and the commissioners oh, and oh, how yeah. that was. Commissions. I got yeah. that pulled up. Okay. One yeah. second. Let me. Uh, I got that pulled up. So what I, what I at least talking about is another one of the. Uh, interesting uh points of unconstitutionality that the the uh, fugitive slave act was and this is going back to uh the book the the unconstitutionality of the fugitive act that was written by uh it's basically a compilation of uh justice byron Payne's uh argument with the federal government right so it's by byron Payne. it's called the fugitive 
the uncon the unconstitutionality of the Fugitive Act. But this is uh, what he's saying on top of what I read earlier. He said the Fugitive Act requires the United States court commissioners to perform all the duties imposed by it. And in order and, and in order that they may do so, vest it in them the concurrent jurisdiction with the circuit courts. But the first section of the third article of the Constitution is as follows. The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may form time to time, ordain and establish. The judges both of the Supreme and inferior courts shall hold their offices during good behavior and shall at states time and, and at stated times receive for their services a compensation which shall not be diminished during their uh, continuance in office. Now it is admitted on all hands that the U.S. court co uh, commissioners are not judges. Either of the supreme or inferior courts spoken of in this section in order to constitute the court's requirement here, they should hold their offices during good behavior and receive their services at stated times, a fixed compensation, whereas in fact they are removable at the pleasure of the court that appoints them and receive a compensation not fixed but uh, proportionate to the amount of services rendered. So mm. that was a, a interesting argument he made about how they set that up. That, yeah. That's where I thought you was going earlier. <laughs> that's why I read the definition of, of fugitive and fugitive slave act from out of the Black's Law Dictionary. I thought you was about to get into that. Oh yeah, uh, I had it pulled up, but uh, basically when they were um, explaining those, with he the the court ref you have to read the entire argument. That was a very good point, and then you can see how they argued that back and forth, but. Basically, he's saying they set up a commission. They didn't go that they still didn't put it in the Constitution. Right. They just set up these commissioners to try to slide this thing in and give it the color of justice. But this uh, see, this is still how you trying to aid and assist criminal activity without having to really uh, legalize this thing and put it into the Constitution. Right. So they're really just like aiding and allowing these making these allowances, but not really having to really commit with no strong constitutional language but this particular uh, uh justice said we're not going to do this and this is a justice raising this argument right so this is all in that narrative of how the civil war got started you see we see states going to war with this criminal enterprise called chattel slavery and this is going all the way up to the supreme court being argued saying that you're not going to make me recognize because the but basically what the southern states were doing were making uh the other the the free states mm -hmm. recognize their slavery you're forcing them, right. you're forcing your state rights on my state right right so they were fighting back and this is what eventually because the the richest people lived in the south so they were doing like you see uh, uh there's a current commission going around it has some kind of similar uh features to it you see a lot of money being dumped in these commissions, right? <laughs> for, for them to do certain things, right? <laughs> Without any real federal commitment to it, right? So we, we got to see these things keep happening now, but the, let's go get, go get that book, The Fugitive Act, The Unconstitutionality of the Fugitive Act by Byron Payne, who was the chief justice uh, of Wisconsin. And, and just read through that argument. And then you, the history is you'll start seeing the, the new narrative that you wasn't taught and how this whole thing was has been argued from day one. We're bringing up the old argument. This ain't no new argument that we done found. This is an old argument that we done unearthed and bring him back to the public. Let's do it again. You know, um, can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just about to read something. Go something ahead. very interesting that um, came up as I was reading through all these different documents. Um, the term free citizen. Free citizen. I was looking at uh, the Federalist Paper number 42 earlier, right? James Madison's 
piece where he was trying to convince the people of New York um, about adopting the Constitution. That's what these federalists were trying to do, just determine whether or not the Constitution of the United States was something uh, worth taking on or not. And so in Federalist number 42, um, James Madison mentions the term free citizen, free citizen, right? And he's referencing it um, based on the fact that it's mentioned in the Articles of Confederation. In the Articles of Confederation, they mention the term free citizen, right? And one of the things that Spooner uh, brings up, which goes along with the idea that we brought up about there being free citizens and citizens who are not free, right? And so the, 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 the point is, is that I just really want the family to understand that, again, these are not concepts that we, we've come up with on our own. You go to the Articles of Confederation and what you're going to do in Article 4 is you're going to find the term free citizen, right? Why do you need to make a, why do you need the term free citizen unless it's implying that there are citizens that are not free? You understand what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. um, normally, right, the way we would look at it and the way we would use the term is citizen of the United States, right, plainly. But I think because of the way the way society was, they felt the need to make this distinction between a free citizen versus a, a someone who's not free, right? They even talk about um, they they even use the term paupers and vagabonds, right? And saying that those people did not they were not included in the privileges and immunities of the free citizens. So I just want you to understand that these are concepts that are not new. These are very old concepts. And so again, for us, it's a matter of making it clear that the United States, in spite of what was in the Declaration of Independence, allowed a particular portion of their society to be by states who pretended that they were, they, that they had more authority than the federal government. Because like mm -hmm. Spooner says, the constitution, at the time of the adoption of the constitution, there was no state constitution that authorized slavery. So when that, when that constitution was adopted, all of the people of the United States became citizens under that document. Then after that, they turned around and started in, in, in enslaving people, you know, not just, after that, but subsequently they continue to enslave people after the adoption of the Constitution. So uh, what he's saying is all of that was unconstitutional because nothing authorized it. So just stick, sticking with the theme of the show. So I see we have something else here from the New York Times that we want to read. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to say, you know, you broke that down. Uh, I like how you broke that down, Ali. And I want to say we just we just need to let them know that we know like uh, we, the reason why we're doing this is so you know y'all so we can build up our awareness so that we can let them know that we are aware of these facts things. facts you ain't no more games to be played with us now so i wanted to read us i want to read something because we were talking about the bloody shirt we were talking about the unconstitutionality of slavery we, we, we talked about how uh the, through the 13th amendment how it was, you know, uh, basically a, another way for them to slickly slide uh, the same benefits that they got from slavery, well, most of the same benefits they got from slavery into the constitution to make it legal. Um, so I just wanna read something about why they did that, the benefits from that, and then translating that over from you know that period right after slavery when they started to use convict leasing and then translating that over to today and then understand I want you to understand that you know when people like you you, you argue with some of these racist devils and stuff like that and they'll tell you things like well you just need to you just need to work hard you need to own a business you need to stop being lazy you need to just do this you need to do that 
Well, the time period for us to catch up is gone. Like this right here, right after slavery, this was a reparations then, that was a time period to do it. Even moving, even after that, it was opportunity, like locking us out of the new deal, doing mass incarceration, like you can forget it. You talk about how we can catch up collectively. We, you, we cannot, the only way is reparations. That's why we talk about reparations, especially right now. Cause this thing that you've been doing this for so long is so far gone. Like there is no cotton that we can get rich on going. We can't pick cotton and get rich. We can't put a bunch of people on a plantation and pick cotton and think we're going to get financial freedom or that the masses of us can get wealth. That's not happening. The days of picking cotton is gone. They didn't already milk cotton all the way through, through, through this, through this right here. So let me just read this cause I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going. Let me read it. During reconstruction, the Ku Klux Klan and local rifle clubs murdered Hundreds of free slaves, now Republican voters, in a successful effort to make Mississippi safe for the Democratic Party. Uh, in the New South, Mississippi led the nation in every imaginable kind of mob atrocity. Most lynchings, most multiple lynchings, most lynchings of women, most lynchings without an arrest, most lynchings of a victim in police custody, and most public support for the process itself. Nearly half a century later, in the 1930s, Mississippians earned less, killed more, and died younger than other Americans. They were five times more likely to be illiterate than a Pennsylvanian and 10 times more likely to take another person's life. The culture of violence provided the setting for the most infamous form of criminal justice in American history, the convict leasing system that prevailed the most southern states uh, to, that prevailed in most southern states for a generation or more after emancipation. Not surprisingly, Mississippi invented convict leasing. Under slavery, black criminals had been punished on the plantation. Virtually the only jail inmates were, were uh, let me say this again. Under slavery, black criminals had been punished on the plantation. Virtually the only jail inmates were whites. So I'm going to stop here because I had, I was arguing, making an argument with somebody who was trying to uh, equate, because um, we were, I was trying to say, well, what's the economic contribution? Because they were trying to say, well, by us, um, you know, I, I, forgive me, I've been forgetting the argument. Basically, he was just trying to say, we can say that whites who were enslaved, uh, whites were slaved by the, by the fact that they were, um, they were held in, they were in jail or whatever. I'm like, well, come on now. Like, that's, you don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. But that's, that's kind of like the argument that people, are, people come up with all kind of wild arguments. I think that was Daryl Scott making that argument. And that's exactly what it was. But I just couldn't recall the exact back and forth right now. So I'm, I'm going to keep it moving. The Civil War destroyed many jails and penitentiaries, while emancipation more than doubled the free population. The crime wave and political violence that accompanied Reconstruction overwhelmed the few and inadequate jails. In desperation, Mississippi and other states turned to an expedient that quickly became an institution, the leasing of convict criminals to private contractors who paid a fee to the state and agreed to feed, clothe, and shelter the convicts during their term of punishment. Now, notice it says, paid a fee to the state. See, but there was no private prisons then. So that means the state of Mississippi was the one leasing you out for profit. Mm. Now, is Mississippi a state that's part of the United States? Oh, yeah. So then this is Mississippi just finding a way to subvert the 13th Amendment or to, to really exploit the indentured servitude clause in order to do slavery again, unjustly. Okay, so let's say, uh, but the motives of the leasees were most emphatically not altruistic. altruistic. They were in this business for profit. They used convicts to build railroads, to mine coal and iron, and to fell timber, make turpentine, clear land, and grow cotton. Since nearly all leased convicts were black, few whites cared what happened to them. And if the supply of convicts fell below the demand, compliant legislators and county sheriffs stood ready to increase the supply. In 1876, the Mississippi legislature enacted the egregious pig law, defining the theft of a farm animal or any property valued at $10 or more as grand larceny, punishable by up to five years in state prison. The convict population quadrupled overnight. Many contractors made fortunes from the cheap labor that they could wow. with impunity. 
Wow. So at least possess the protection of their value as property, the, the lives of black convicts had no value in the eyes of whites. Morality rates in convict camps rose to, excuse me, mortality rates in convict camps rose to shocking levels. The death rate among convicts in Mississippi during the 1880s ranged from 9 to 16 percent annually. Quote, not a single least convict, Mr. Oshinsky, quote, notes, ever lived long enough to serve a sentence of 10 years or more. Damn. Let me say that again. Not a single least convict ever lived long enough to serve a sentence of 10 years or more. Damn. So when we want to talk about <laughs> and all this Spanish flu and all this, that ain't nothing compared to getting locked up in Mississippi. Not the death rate was nine to sixteen percent, and you could never live longer than no, but not one person lived longer than ten years in, in, up in there. So it says it was wow. it, it was a system. It was this system, not the parchment prison that the Southern reformer George Washington Cable described as worse than slavery. By the eighteen eighties, the barbarism of convict leasing had become an embarrassment even to white Mississippians. Reformers in all Southern states crusaded against the system. By the early 20th century, they had succeeded in getting it abolished almost everywhere, though in several states it was replaced by state or county chain gangs, not necessarily a great improvement. In Mississippi, the convict leasing was replaced by parchment, a prison farm located on 20,000 acres of the world's richest cotton land in, in the Yazoo, Mississippi Delta. <laughs> So it is isn't it interesting? Now think about this. Do you think they would have let a prison be put on the land when it was under um private ownership, when it was under a private bonded system? No. But when you're under a public subjugation system where the mm -hmm. slavery is through the 13th Amendment, then you will take the, the the richest, the world's richest cotton land, and you will put a prison on it so you can do slavery, because that's the only way you can do it. Neo slavery. That's right. right. The best right. chapter in Worse Than Slavery describes in describes life and work for the inmates at Parchment from 1904 to the 1930s. During that time, the proportion of black inmates declined from 90 to 70 percent. Whether Parchment was worse than slavery is not clear from Mr. Oshinsky's account. What is clear is that it was very much like slavery. The superintendent functioned like a slave owner. The white guard sergeants where the overseers and the trustees armed with shotguns and rifles resembled nothing so much as black drivers on the slave plantations. And, and Parchment was a huge plantation, growing thousands of bales of car, cotton, which produced a handsome profit for the, state of, for the state of Mississippi, which produced a handsome profit for the state of Mississippi. Exploitation, violence and racism, and repression characterized, par characterized Parchment. Mr. Oshinsky reproduces the words of several blues songs that portray parchment and experience with sad eloquence. But what emerges from Mr. Oshinsky's account is a set of ironies that he implicitly acknowledges but does not explicitly develop. Parchment was better than convict leasing, was probably less brutal in his treatment of black inmates than the prisons or chain gangs of other Southern states. In an odd twist, it may have been better in some respects than what the civil rights revolution of the 1960s forced it to become. I, I just wanted to read that, y'all, because Ooh. I think, oh, oh, one more, one more thing, real quick, real quick. I just, I just gotta hold up, hold up. I just gotta say, um, rest in peace to uh, Kamala, Ka rest in peace to Kamala Harris, rest in peace to Kamala Harris. I don't know if y'all saw this. Hold up, let me bring it up real quick. Y'all see this? Rest in peace to Kamala Harris. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. No, I was just joking. I knew I knew y'all. I knew I, I got some of y'all. I got some of <laughs> I, I ain't trying to make the brothers death a joke. Please <laughs> we were talking about Mississippi. So uh, but I just had to say rest in peace to Kamala Harris. No, I feel you. Not that, not Kamala Harris. Nah, nah. The Ugandan giant Kamala. The only Kamala uh, <laughs> from Uganda. That's facts, what. facts. So um, we, we're past our two-hour mark. Brother Logic had to lo log off. Uh, Brother Ali, did you have anything else that you wanted to add? No, I think we good for the night. 
Um, I just hope everybody got something out of the program and, and um, you know what I mean? We can continue to build on this, this, this line of, uh, of, of, of history because it's very important. Definitely, definitely. Um, man, I'm going to take us up out of here then. Shout out to my team, first and foremost. I want to give a shout out to everybody in the chat. Shout out to the moderators, everybody that tuned in. If you are not subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button. As you can see, at, at we here at Be The Power, we like to give a political education mixed with a historical education that's still a political education. And what this platform is designed to do is empower us to become the power, to give us a greater education as we move forward and possibly even think about becoming politicians, if not even, or just having a better understanding, I should say, about the process of voting and this freedom fight that we we have to undertake, that we have to continue. Some people, you know, they've checked out a long time ago. They've, they've used uh, the immigrant class from the, particularly the continent to try to drown us out. They've used uh, people of immigrant import like Candace Owens, right? <laughs> try to get us to jump from out of the frying pan, the Democratic Party, into the fire, which is the Republican Party. Right? Trying to make it seem as if we have no other choices but that is simply not the truth. But the best option I believe that we have is the type of education that you get here on the B, the Power Channel and, and several other uh, YouTube channels, you know, in, involved with the uh, ADOS, American Descendants of Slavery movement and, and the lineage itself. Right? You, I've seen people that have YouTube channels who are Haitians, Haitian Americans, who ride with what ADOS is saying. So we want to give shout outs to everybody that's that's tuning in, that's listening, but who are also out there fighting the good fight, who are not co-opted and corrupted by the uh, puppet wizardry of the Democratic Party and are being confused and com and those who are uh, seeking to convolute what this particular fight and push for reparations is for. We want to give shouts out to you all as we say on this platform that we don't just want to fight the power. We also want to become the power so that then we can have the power to make a change. And with that, I say peace.